All right, boys, welcome back. Unit seven this time, we're gonna be covering equilibrium. Okay, so th this equilibrium, this unit seven uh, stage is usually where we start to escape the matrix of the chemistry that you think you know, but you really don't. Okay, so what is an equilibrium? Well, let's start with an example. You've got A plus B with this special type of arrow forming C, okay? This is our equilibrium arrow. We write this in all of our equilibrium chemical equations, okay? This arrow, as you can see, has half an arrow going towards C and half of an arrow from C going back to A and B. That means that equilibrium reactions are a combination of reactants forming products and products forming reactants, okay? So, some reactions, in fact most reactions, are reversible. Okay, reversible reactions means that the products can go backwards. The products can break down again to form reactants. Okay, so let's take it back to a reference on molecular collisions, collision theory. Okay, we know that for a reaction to happen, two molecules need to collide. Okay, so A plus B collide, reactants collide to form a product. Okay. Now, that product may collide with something else. Maybe the product collides with itself. C collides with another C, and that causes a reverse reaction. C then breaks down into A and B. Okay? So, in order to represent that, I suppose our equation should be 2A plus 2B forms 2C so that two C particles collide with each other to turn back into the two A particles and the two B particles. If you were to draw like a particulate representation of this, which as you know on the AP exam you'll always have to draw particulate representations, you'd have A's and B's floating around at the beginning of the reaction, okay? At the beginning of the reaction, we only put in reactants, okay? So at the beginning of the action, A's and B's are going to collide, and they're going to form C's. But now, two C's can collide, and they can form A's and B's, okay? So what I'm trying to get across here is that a reaction can exist where it can go one way, and it can also go backwards, all right? And the term equilibrium if you guys know, equilibrium means a state of balance, a state of no change. Equilibrium means that the forward rate of the reaction is the same as the reverse rate of the reaction. So if you look at that at a particulate level, that means that the rate of A's and B's colliding to form C is the same rate at which C's are colliding to form A's and B's, okay? And if the reaction is happening at the same rate in both directions, then that means there's no observable change, right? Think of it like you're on a boat, and the boat's got a hole in it, the boat's starting to sink, okay? Water coming into the boat would be like our forward reaction, and us shoveling or taking a bucket and throwing water off the boat would, our, would be our reverse reaction, okay? So forward reaction, water coming into the boat, reverse reaction, us taking water out of the boat. Okay? So if water is coming into the boat at the same rate that we are throwing water out of the boat, then the amount of water in the boat stays constant. Okay? We are throwing out just as much as coming in. So that's what we mean when we say equilibrium. The rates are equal, therefore there's no observable change in the concentration of products and the reactants. There's no observable change in the level of water in the boat. So that can be uh, best exemplified in the form of a graph, okay? On the x-axis, we're going to graph time, and on the y-axis, we're going to graph relative concentration. Okay, relative concentration of our products and our reactants, okay? So in a reaction, obviously, you put in, pro you put in reactants, all right? Products are formed. You usually don't start with products. You start with reactants. So, the concentration of our reactants 
is going to start really high up here. And since we only have reactants right now, the concentration of our products, we're not going to have any. Products haven't been formed yet. We haven't started the reaction yet, so that's going to be zero, okay? But as the reaction progresses, the relative concentration of reactants is going to start declining. It's going to start declining. And as the concentration of our reactants starts declining, if reactant concentration is declining, that means reactants are being used up to form products. So if we're forming products, that means the concentration of our products starts to rise. Okay? And you see I drew it here such that they each level out at the end. Okay, why did I draw it that way? Because this is an equilibrium reaction. Even an equilibrium reaction, after enough time has passed, the reactants and products will be in equilibrium with one another. We will see no observable change in their concentrations. So if there's no observable change in the concentrations as time goes on, the concentration will remain flat, it will remain static, it will remain unchanged. These types of graphs do generally pop up on the AP exam. Very, very simple type of problem. It's always a multiple choice, usually just one. And they're going to say, okay, here's point A, B, C, and D. Which point represents the point at which this reaction reaches equilibrium? You know, it's, it's really easy, but you just got to remember what this graph represents. It's obviously D. We have a way in which we can model equilibrium, okay? And that is with Q and K, all right? So what are those things? Well, Q and K, Q is called the reaction quotient. You remember because quotient Q and K is the equilibrium constant. So they each have their own equation, which are the same exact equation. I'll show you in just a minute. The reaction for the uh, equilibrium constant K, concentration of products over concentration of reactants to their respective exponents. I say their respective exponents because uh, let's use this reaction for for example, okay? C is a product. C has a coefficient of 2, okay? That means that C as a product would be raised to a, co a, a power of 2, all right? So given this, let's write out the K for the reaction given here, okay? K equals a concentration of products, which would be C squared over the concentration of reactants, which would be concentration of A squared times concentration of B squared. Okay? So that's what we're looking at here. Now there are two types of K. You can have KC, which is what these are. This is C represents concentration. Or you can have KP. P represents pressure. In this case, partial pressure. Okay, so if these were in the uh, gaseous phase, we would use Kp for the partial pressure of reactants and products. And if we were right to Kp, write the Kp for this reaction, it's the same type of equation. It's the partial pressure of reactant C squared divided by the partial pressure of reactant A squared times the partial pressure of reactant B squared. Okay? So the same general structure of the equation, except in this, uh, in the Kp equation, you're given partial pressures and you're expected to use partial pressures. In Kc, you're given concentrations, you're expected to use concentrations. K represents what are the concentrations of our species at equilibrium, okay? Where the equilibrium point is, is constant the equilibrium point will not change, okay? So the concentrations of each of our species in our reaction, once they reach equilibrium, equilibrium is a well-defined point. Therefore, the concentrations of the species at equilibrium are constant. They are well-defined and they can be solved for like this. That stands in comparison to our reaction quotient, Q, okay? 
you again, you can have QC or you can have QP, right? QP would be the partial pressure of C squared divided by the partial pressure of A squared times partial pressure of B squared. As you'll notice, they are the same exact equation. Again, the squares represent the coefficients and the products are on the top, reactants are on the bottom. Q represents anything apart from equilibrium, all right? So K, the rate constant, represents the concentrations at equilibrium, but if our reaction is not currently at equilibrium, if we are at some, some location whether we have more products, too many products, or too many reactants, it's a place apart from equilibrium. We would plug the relative concentrations or the partial pressures of our reaction, reactants and products into this equation, and we would solve for something called the reaction quotient, okay? The general rule of thumb is the reaction always tends to equilibrium. The reaction always goes towards equilibrium. If I'm given that the reaction is not at equilibrium, which uh, the most common way they tell you that on the AP exam is before the reaction happens, I put these reactants into the chamber. If I have only reactants, then I'm obviously not at equilibrium. So that's usually how they do that. If I am told like that or otherwise that I'm not at equilibrium, I'm going to calculate a Q and I'm going to say, okay, Q is going to either be less than or greater than K, right? because Q represents the state of the reaction either with excess products or excess reactants relative to K. We always want to get to K. If Q is larger than K, let's look at what that looks like. Since Q is products over reactants, okay, what would increase the value of Q? Increasing the value of Q would mean I would increase products or decrease reactants. And as we show in this graph, as we increase products, we simultaneously decrease reactants. So these two changes are coupled together. They happen simultaneously, okay? So an increase in products and a decrease in reactants results in an increased Q. So Q being increased represents too many products. And by the same logic, Q being too low represents an excess of reactants. If Q is low, that means that reactants will be consumed to form products in order to achieve equilibrium, in order to take Q to K. At equilibrium, Q equals K, okay? That's what the reaction wants. It wants Q to equal K. It wants the uh, concentration of C squared at equilibrium to equal what we calculate here in Q. And the same goes for if Q is greater than K. If Q is greater than K, Q wants to shrink. And how does Q shrink? Q shrinks by decreasing the numerator and increasing the denominator. That means consuming products to form reactants, therefore shifting Q closer to K and eventually to K. Okay, so each reaction has a definitive K value. So uh, let's say I give you another reaction. I give you A plus B equals C plus D. I'll tell you that the K for this equals uh, 1 times 10 to the 9th, okay? K equals 1 times 10 to the 9th. So let's write that out. Let's say KC, because they'll specify. KC equals 1 times 10 to the 9th. That means that I have got, let's look at this equation, 1 times 10 to the 9th equals uh, concentration of C times concentration of D, over concentration of A times concentration of B. 1 times 10 to the 9th, that's a really big number, okay? Even though we don't exactly know how to solve for each of these concentrations just yet, we can see that since this is really big, we must have a really big numerator and a really small denominator, okay? So what does that tell us? Since this is the K value, it tells us that at equilibrium, we have a stupid amount of products and a really small amount of react. At equilibrium, there's going to be pretty much none of this and pretty much all of this. So the reaction effectively goes to completion. All right, what does that mean? Going to completion means that 
largely all of the reactants turn into products, okay? And the same can also be said for a very small k. Say I give you a k value of 1 times 10 to like the negative 5. Okay, that's a really small value. In order to achieve a really small value, our numerator has to be small and our denominator has to be big. That tells us that once we reach equilibrium, we're going to have many more reactants than products. So that type of a reaction would favor reactants more and there would not be much reaction happening. So, like I said before, every reaction has a K value. Every equilibrium reaction has a K value. If you guys remember Hess's law from our previous video on thermodynamics, I referenced that there was a Hess's law for delta H and there's a Hess's law for equilibrium. Let's cover that right now, okay? So, in largely the same fashion that we saw in delta H, you're going to be given a series of reactions, usually three, as we saw before, we're going to need to manipulate these equations to cancel each other out, okay? This guy, A plus E is in equilibrium with C. We got to reverse that. We got to flip it, okay? So by flipping this, C now being in equilibrium with A plus E, when I flip it, I take the reciprocal of my KC. So now this becomes um, 1 over... 1.2 times 10 to the negative 3. If I am to, let's say, deal with these coefficients, okay, I need to divide all of these coefficients by 2, okay? So I need to multiply everything by a coefficient of 1 half. When I multiply the equation by a coefficient, okay, so now this whole coefficient is 1 half, I take the Kc, and I raise it to that coefficient. Now this whole KC is raised to the one half, okay? And then once I orient all these equations to cancel each other out, okay? So A cancels with A, uh, C cancels with C, D cancels with D, and I'm left with B is in equilibrium with F plus G. Then, I combine all of these KC values to get this guy. How do I combine them? I multiply all of them, okay? So this times this times this, and I get my final KC for the final reaction. From this point on, we're going to start covering the really big thing in equilibrium, this thing called Rice Charts, okay? Now, there are, equilibrium is probably the favorite topic on all AP exam FRQs. Literally, it's, equilibrium is the favorite for FRQ, okay? And that's because not only does it have pertinence in the equilibrium unit, but equilibrium unit is an essential component of our acids and bases units, next unit, okay? So, let's get into what that looks like, all right? A rice chart. So a rice chart is in this form, R, I, C, E, okay? R stands for reaction, I stands for initial, C stands for change, and E stands for equilibrium. Yeah, that's what it stands for. <laughs> We're in the equilibrium unit. Okay, don't, don't make fun of me. All right, so we're going to be given a reaction. All right, let's say that we were given the reaction A plus B equilibrium with C. Okay, so that's what we would put in the reaction section of our chart. A plus B equilibrium with C. Okay, initial. They would give you initial concentrations of the reactants. I put this much reactant into the reaction vessel, how will this reach equilibrium, okay? Initial concentration, either they're gonna give you concentrations or they're going to give you grams. You're gonna to need to convert to moles. We know how to do that. And they're going to give you how uh, many liters of solution the reaction vessel has in it, okay? So you would convert grams to moles, then you would convert moles divided by liters to get concentration. Or, 
very common. The equilibrium is very often assessed in a gaseous form, okay? So it would be a gaseous reaction vessel, and they would tell you, okay, I put this many grams of CO2 into the reaction vessel. You would convert grams to moles. Always do that. That's always your first thing to do. Then once you have moles, you can go into your PV, that's R, you can go into your PV equals NRT equation. They would give you temperature. They would give you volume. You just solved for moles. The R is the constant that's on your reference table. And your goal here is to solve for pressure. Because what can we use pressure in? A Kp, partial pressure. And because in here you, you, you're using moles of CO2, you're going to get the partial pressure of CO2. You know, if you put total moles in the entire reaction, you would get the total pressure of the reaction. That's why I love this equation. Because it doesn't apply to exclusively the whole vessel. If I just wanted to plug in, okay, how many moles of argon gas do I have? Okay, I have five moles of argon gas. Then this equation will give me the partial pressure of argon gas. Your goal is to solve for either the concentration or the partial pressure. Okay, how do you know which one to solve for? Because in this problem, they're going to give you your K. And they're going to give you either a Kc or a Kp. Okay, I'm going to... I know this is all wonky and out of place right now, but I'm going to show you how you go about this problem, and then I'm going to show you a problem that we can solve together, okay? You're given grams of A and B, or you're just outright given concentrations, or you're outright given partial pressures. Let's say partial pressure of A is uh, 1.2, partial pressure of B is 2.1, okay? And we don't start with any C. Like, we're just starting with reactants and we're trying to form C. So we have zero C initially, okay? So our change is the where we introduce the variable, okay? And I'm gonna tell you what this means when I write it out. Our change in A is minus X, our change in B is minus X, and our change in C is X. All right, what does that mean? It means that as the reaction is promoted, as the reaction t travels towards equilibrium, some amount of concentration will be subtracted from A. Why is it subtracted from A? Because reactants are being consumed as the reaction goes towards equilibrium. So some amount of reactant A is consumed, and since these are in a one-to-one -one mole ratio. The same amount of reactant B is consumed. So let me show you what that would look like as an example. If this was instead A plus 2B form C, then this would be minus X minus 2X, okay? Because twice the concentration of A is being consumed from B, all right? One mole of A and two moles of B are being consumed. So twice of B is being consumed. And as reactants are consumed, you start to form products. And the amount of products, again, depends on your molar ratios, depends on your stoichiometric ratios. So as I can see here, I consumed one mole of A and formed one mole of C. So I subtracted one concentration, one X, from A, and that became one concentration of C. Two moles of B are being consumed to form C. So I'm subtracting two concentrations. Remember, we haven't solved for X yet. Two concentrations from B to form one concentration of C. Okay? So, equilibrium. Next part of the chart. Okay? At equilibrium, what's going to happen? What are our concentrations going to look like? Okay? Our at equilibrium, it's going to be our initial concentration minus the change in concentration. That's for A. At B, it's going to be our initial concentration minus our change in concentration. That's for B. 
And for C, it's going to be our initial concentration plus our change in concentration. And that's just going to reduce to X, okay? So, at equilibrium, this is what our reaction looks like, okay? Now's the time when we look back up to the problem and we realize they gave us a Kc, okay? So, let's just say that our Kc is... Uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 4. That's a decimal. 1 times 10 to the negative 4. Now that I have my Kc, I can write my equation. Because we just figured out what the concentration of everything is at equilibrium. And K tells us what the concentration of everything is at equilibrium. So I can say uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 4 equals the concentration of products over the concentration of reactants. 1.2 minus x times, oh, well, you don't need this anymore. This is just work right now. You can use parentheses now. Uh, 2.1 minus 2x. Except, look back up here. In our k equation, we need to pay attention to the coefficients in our reaction. So since b is a coefficient of 2, this is squared, okay? So now I have one variable, a single variable that I can solve for. I'm, there is a function on your calculator called the, um, the solver function. I'm not sure exactly how to use it, but you can go look up on YouTube, look on the internet, how to solve uh, equilibrium problems with the graphing calculator, and they'll show you. My teacher taught me to do something else, okay? My teacher taught me that, okay, my equilibrium constant is 1 times 10 to the negative 4. That means my equilibrium constant is very small, okay? What, now, let me specify for you this. What exactly is the cutoff? for a k constant being very small. I'd say the cutoff is if your k is less than 1 times 10 to the negative third, you're able to say k is very small. If k is very small, you are able to write, I assume x is small. I assume x is small, okay? You're allowed to do that because your k is very small, okay? So what does that assumption mean? Again, you're writing this on your sheet of paper. What does that assumption mean? It means that all of my x's that are being subtracted to or added to a number are now negligible, okay? So this is the way my teacher explained it to me. They said, okay, You've got a million dollars, okay? If I subtract a dollar from a million dollars, I still pretty much have a million dollars, okay? In this case, one dollar is your x, okay? If x is very small, if I subtract a very small amount, like a dollar, from a million dollars, I have 900,000, 999,099, all of this it's pretty much a million dollars. Therefore, subtracting x produced a negligible change. The same goes if I added a dollar to my million dollars. By adding x, by adding an extremely small x, an extremely small amount of money to my million dollars, I still pretty much have only a million dollars. The change in my total money is negligible, okay? And if you are very good with significant figures, you should know that it's negligible, okay? However, if I would say that I only have X, if I only have $1, any change in that value is pretty important because it's only a dollar, right? So if I subtract like 40 cents from a dollar, that's a pretty big change in my dollar, okay? So what I'm trying to get across to you here is if I see x by itself, I leave that there. If I see x being subtracted to or added to another number, 
then I can say that is negligible, all right? So let me show you that in practice. Once I assume x is small, once I write this, I can rewrite my k equation as 1 times 10 to the negative 4 equals x over 1.2 times 2.1 squared, okay? It feels like cheating, it feels like you're not supposed to do this, but trust me, it is the most effective way to solve your uh, rice charts, okay? And, you know, if you made a mistake and you omitted this x as well, then you'd be sitting there scratching your head saying, wait a minute, I have nothing to solve for, okay? So if you find yourself in that situation, that means you crossed out, you omitted too many x's. If you find an x by itself, or you find a 2x, or you find an x to the third, you gotta leave that by itself, okay? You gotta leave that alone. You're only ever able to omit the x's that are added to or subtracted from a constant number that you see there, all right? So now that we come down here and we have this equation, this is much easier for you to solve. In this case, you just grab your calculator and you say, Okay, let me multiply both sides by this. Okay, 1 times 10 to the negative 4 times 1.2 times 2.1 squared, and that's x. Now I can solve for x, all right? And in this case, my x equals 5.29 times 10 to the negative 4, okay? And if you assumed x was small, again, if you looked at your k value and you saw that your k value is really small, and that's allowed you to assume x is small, once you actually solve for x, you should get a really small value. Makes sense, okay? But you're not done here, okay? The question might, uh, might ask you things like, what is the concentration at C? What is the concentration of C at equilibrium? In that case, the concentration of C at equilibrium is x. So in this case, you would be done. Or, it might ask you something like, what is the concentration of B at equilibrium? Uh, in which case, you would need to perform this operation you see here. I take 2.1 and I subtract from it 2x. And I'd say, that's the concentration of B at equilibrium. But remember, you know, stay reasonable. Stay within your domain of significant figures. Ah, yes, one thing I forgot to mention. Okay. So when we're building k's and when we're building q's, okay, we're using either concentrations or we're using partial pressures, okay? So, something I need to clarify right now, okay? The only thing that can have a concentration is something that is in aqueous solution, okay? That's when you've got moles of solute, like moles of NaCl, moles of Na+, moles of Cl-, divided by liters of solution, okay? So it would make sense for me to have a concentration of Cl minus, okay? That stands oppo as opposed to like a block of wood, all right? If I dropped a block of wood in aqueous solution, the block of wood would not dissolve, okay? The block of wood does not have a concentration, okay? So what I'm trying to get across to you is that if I have solids, in my chemical equation, like let's say D was a solid, it's in the solid phase, then it would not be a part of this equation, okay? Because I cannot have a concentration for a solid particulate. Solids do not have a concentration, so they, they do not exist in our K expression. Another instance of that is in the case of liquids. If C was a liquid, I erased B by accident. I should have erased D. Anyway, another case for that is liquids, okay? If I have pure water, pure water, my moles of solute divided by my liters of solution, my, my concentration, my concentration of a pure liquid is always one, right? If I have a glass of water, what is the concentration of water in my glass of water? It's, it's just water, it's pure water. If it's a pure liquid you're dealing with, then it does not participate 
in your equation, okay? So if I'm told that C is a liquid, and the way I'd be told that is if it has the little liquid subscript, then C would not be participating in my equation, okay? So if my C is a liquid and my D is a solid, both of them don't participate in the equation, and I'm just left with a 1 up here. And if you're given B as a gas, if you're given B as a gas, let's say, you can have concentrations of gas. That's possible, but you'd have to be given it. You don't know how to solve for concentration of a gas. You know how to solve for the partial pressure of a gas. Okay? But if I gave you the equation A plus B in equilibrium with C, and all three of them are gases, okay, and I'm given a problem that gives me a Kc of like 1 times 10 to the third, it gives me a Kc, then it doesn't matter if they're all gases. The Kc dictates that I need to use concentrations, okay? Let me give you an example of this whole rice chart business that I went over before. The following reaction of carbon, solid carbon, plus CO2 gas uh, in equilibrium with two carbon monoxide gas. And they give us that the Kp for the following reaction is 2.4 times 10 to the negative 9. Okay. The initial concentration of CO2, initial concentration of CO2, is two atmospheres. Okay, it told us that it was two atmospheres. Atmospheres is a unit of pressure, so that plays in very well with our Kp. Then it asks, what are the partial pressures of the substances at equilibrium? So it's asking us for the partial pressures of everything at equilibrium. All right, so to do that, we start by making our rice chart. R, I, C, E, carbon, solid, plus CO2, gas, in equilibrium with two carbon monoxide, gas. Now, carbon, we're told it's a solid. The solid does not participate in the K equation. So we see a solid, we draw a big X through it. That's what you do. Moving on. CO2 gas. We're given the initial concentration of CO2 gas in the form of partial pressure. Two atmospheres means that we're just starting out. We have not formed any product yet. Okay? And if we have not formed any product yet, then the concentration or partial pressure of our product is zero. The change CO2, one mole of CO2, so this is minus one concentration, forms two moles of carbon monoxide, plus two concentrations. That means at equilibrium, we're going to have two minus x atmospheres of CO2, and we're going to have two x atmospheres of carbon monoxide. All right? So... Now that we found out what the concentrations of everything is at equilibrium, we go and we get our Kp expression. I always recommend when you do these sorts of problems, always write your Kp uh, unsubstituted first. So what I mean by that, I'll show you. We would write Kp for this equation would equal partial pressure of CO squared over partial pressure of CO2, okay? I'd always recommend writing this before you solve your problem. One, it makes less room for error. Two, again, the reader thinks you are stupid. The reader is looking for reasons to take points off. You are there to show the reader that you know your stuff. Walk the reader through your process. Show the reader that you are a good chemistry student, okay? And that often means showing more work than you absolutely need to. So, and then, once we do this rice chart, we can take our Kp expression and we can plug in. 2.4 times 10 to the negative 9 equals partial pressure of CO squared, 2x, all squared, over partial pressure of CO2, 2 minus x, 
We're going to rewrite that. 4x squared over 2 minus x. I look up at my kp, and I'm going to write, since this is less than 10 to the negative third, 3, like I gave you right here, this is my general parameter, since k is less than that value, I write, assume x is small. Assume x is small, okay? It's very important that you write this on your FRQ. If you don't write this and you suddenly start omitting terms for no reason, the reader is going to have a real problem with that, okay? You need to explain what you're doing. Assume x is small. Then this can be rewritten as 4x squared over 2, okay? So, again, I cross out, I neglect the x's that are participating in addition or subtraction, and any x that is participating in multiplication or squaring by itself, that's what I want to keep. That's I don't touch that. Okay? 4x squared over 2 equals my 2.4 times 10 to the negative 9. Okay? Now this is just a simple problem. You plug into your calculator. 4x squared equals, and multiply both sides by 2, 4.8 times 10 to the negative 9. Okay, so once I solve for x, I get x equals 3.46 times 10 to negative 5. Okay, and once you get your x, you say, okay, times 10 to negative 5. That's a really small x. So I was good to assume x was small. Now that I've got x, the problem asked us, what is the concentration of everything at equilibrium? So, you would write the concentration of CO2 at equilibrium would just be 2 minus this, 2 minus your x. Concentration of carbon monoxide at equilibrium is x times 2, 2x, and you would write that number in proper units, of course, atmospheres. And this isn't necessary, but you know how I am. You always got to show your reader you know your stuff. I would include, since carbon is a solid, its concentration is not changing with respect to the reaction. And you just, you would say that, and you wouldn't write a concentration for carbon. Take every opportunity you have to demonstrate to the reader that you know your stuff. And the, explaining that carbon is a solid is solids concentrations don't change, therefore it does not change concentration and it doesn't participate in the K expression. It's a great way of showing the reader you know your stuff. Next topic, Le Chatelier's principle. I would be here for 10 minutes if I tried to spell that. I'm gonna abbreviate it LC, Le Chatelier's principle, LCP, whatever, okay. Le Chatelier's principle states that the equilibrium can be stressed or strained or modified due to different factors, okay? And it's not something you need to memorize. It's something that you can reason your way through if you forget, okay? So, the, uh, the general factors are changes in concentration, changes in concentration, changes in temperature, changes in pressure, changes in volume. Pressure and volume and things like dilution, these all affect, but they all fall under the category of changes in concentration. If I were to give you the equation, again, A plus B in equilibrium with C plus D. So let me write the equilibrium constant, K, equilibrium constant K, C. K, C equals concentration of C, concentration of D over concentration of A times concentration of B. If I were to remove some D, if I were to decrease the concentration of D, removing some amount of D is analogous to decreasing its concentration, as I hope you realize. What does that mean? That means that Q because now we're no longer at equilibrium, our concentrations have changed. Decrease concentration of D, decrease this, okay? If we remove some D, 
That means our numerator decreased and our Q decreased. If our Q decreased, that means that we have too few products and too many reactants, okay? So we need to increase Q again to get to K, okay? So how are we gonna increase Q? We're gonna form more products, okay? So effectively what it is, is it's replacing the D that you took out. Not entirely, but it's, do, it's working to replace some of the D that you removed. We not only increase the concentration of D, but we increase the concentration of C along with it. The concentration of products and reactants is back to equilibrium, okay? So what you did when you removed D is that some A and B was consumed to produce more D, okay? So by removing D, not only did you remove some D, but you also made the reaction consume a bit of A and B to replace the D that you took out. Now, because you removed D, you, rem you decreased the total amount of particles in the equilibrium system. Now, by decreasing the total amount of particles in the equilibrium system, you decreased the concentration of D and A and B, okay? However, you did increase the concentration of C because the reaction shifted to the right to replace the D, but it also made more C in the process of doing that. So let's say this is a gaseous equilibrium, and I decide to add more A and B. I add more A and B after the system has reached equilibrium. By adding more A and B, I have increased the pressure of the total system, but I have also increased the relative concentrations of A and B. So the, the reaction will shift to the right, it'll shift to products, and it'll consume A and B to form C and D, okay? Such that we return to our natural equilibrium concentration, okay? Okay, so volume, they like to ask volume in a very interesting manner. So let me give you a different example for this. Let's say I gave you A plus B in equilibrium with C. If I draw the Kp for this, then I'd have partial pressure of C over partial pressure of A times partial pressure of B, okay? So, how does volume relate to this? Let's look back at our gas law equation, PV equals nRT, okay? As I change volume, as I increase or decrease volume, changing the size of my container doesn't change how many moles of gas I have. Changing the volume of the container doesn't change the temperature in the container. So, decreasing volume, let's say, would have to increase pressure and vice versa. Increasing volume would have to decrease pressure. Okay, let's stick with that. Let's stick with increasing volume. Okay? When you perform a change on the volume of a, of a container, the, part, the total pressure in the container will decrease. Increased volume decreases the total pressure in the container. So, the pressure of all of these species will decrease, okay? The partial pressure of C will decrease, the partial pressure of B will decrease, and the partial pressure of A will decrease. But as I look at the example, I see the numerator, my concentration of C is decreasing by, I don't know, let's call this X, and the partial pressure of my denominator is decreasing by X, and x. It's decreasing once with the pressure of A, and it's decreasing a second time with the pressure of B. So it's decreasing twice as much as the numerator, okay? So when we increase the volume, the denominator becomes very small, and the numerator also shrinks, but it doesn't become as small, okay? So what I'm conveying here is that the denominator is disproportionately smaller than the numerator, which means in total, our Kp went up, okay? The denominator being much smaller 
small denominator means much larger number, okay? So since this went up, this becomes our reaction quotient Q. We're no longer at equilibrium. If it's high, how do we shrink it? We decrease numerator and we use it to form denominator. We decrease products, we use it to form reactants to decrease Q and return it to K. All right, so you would say the reaction shifts from products to reactants, it shifts to the left, and, react and products are consumed to form more reactants. All right, it's a similar idea with dilution as to uh, concentration. Uh, excuse me, it's a similar idea uh, with dilution as to volume. When you dilute um, a substance, when you dilute a solution by adding more water, the concentration of everything decreases. So if you dilute something with water, that means that you're going to have to pay attention to which side decreases more. Okay? So if you've got a reaction like this with two moles on the reactant side and one mole on the product side, that means that whichever side has more moles will experience the change harder. If I dilute a reaction, the products are, no, if I diluted this reaction, the reactants would bear that burden more heavily. The reactants would become more dilute because there's more of them, okay? So that means in such a scenario, the reaction would shift to form more reactants. And the same is true if I had two moles of products and one mole of reactants. If I diluted that, we would shift towards products. Okay. Now the last one is temperature. And temperature is unique, okay? Because um, we're going to need to take a look at some information regarding the reaction itself, okay? Let's say I was given um, this solution of NaCl in water, okay? NaCl solid is in equilibrium with Na plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous, okay? So, I don't know whether it's exothermic or endothermic, but let's just say that, let's pretend it's exothermic. So it releases heat. If it's exothermic, it releases heat. We can write our equilibrium equation if it's an exothermic reaction such that it also produces heat as a product. If it was an endothermic reaction, we would say it consumes heat as a reactant, okay? So, with temperature, as temperature rises, we could say that the concentration of heat rises. And if that happens, then we suddenly have an increase in concentration of products, and we shift to reactants. Okay, if we decrease temperature, we have a decrease in concentration of products, and we shift to form products. All right, except temperature is unique because temperature, if let's say that this dissolution, NaCl dissociate into Na plus and Cl minus, if that's at equilibrium right now, and I increase the temperature, it doesn't mean that by increasing the temperature, I have changed the reaction quotient Q. By changing the temperature, it doesn't mean that the concentration of my uh, NaCl and this and that have changed, because I didn't change the concentration of anything in the reaction. I only changed the temperature, okay? So, in order for this equilibrium to shift, the actual K, the actual position of the equilibrium has to change, okay? So, by, if I look at this, and I say, okay, heat went down, that means we're going to shift further towards products. If I say, all right, I'm shifting further towards products. Products are in the numerator of my K expression. So if I'm increasing products, I'm increasing the numerator of my K expression. Therefore, my K expression will increase. My K value itself will change as a result of temperature. 
All right. So if I started with a Kc of 1 times 10 to the negative 4, let's say this reaction had that Kc, then by decreasing the temperature, by decreasing uh, the concentration of heat, I guess you could say, the products shift to, it shifts towards products, and in shifting towards products, it stays there. The equilibrium itself shifts towards products. So our K value now becomes something like 3 times 10 to the negative 4. Last section, we're going to be covering uh, KSP and the common ion effect. So let's stick with this. The NaCl solid dissociates into Na plus and Cl minus. The KSP is a type of K that uh, deals with solubility. All right. So a solubility, a KSP, would be in water. It would be a dissociation in water, a reaction that looks just like this, which is why this is such a good example. Okay. So if we tried to create a K value, in this case it would be called a KSP, again, it's products over reactants, equals concentration of Na plus, plus the concentration of Cl minus, over the concentration of reactants. NaCl is a solid. We have no reactants, just over one, okay? So this ceases to be a fraction now. Okay, oh, I shouldn't say plus, this is a multiplication. All right, so like I said before, let's just pretend that the K value of this reaction is three times 10 to the negative four. That would equal our concentration of Na plus times our concentration of Cl minus at any given moment, okay? So if this is a pretty small number, this is times 10 to the negative 4. That means at these conditions, at this temperature, like I said before, the position of the equilibrium, how many products form and how many reactants form at equilibrium is dependent on temperature. If I change the temperature, I change the location at which equilibrium occurs. None of these other factors can do that. These other factors change concentrations. And in changing concentrations, they uh, turn the great constant into a Q. And that Q then comes back to the original K rate constant. Not rate constant, equilibrium constant, I should say. Okay, back to this. Since this is small, I know that there's only a small amount of ions in the solution right now, okay? So, what happens if I add more NaCl, let's say, if I add more reactants. Well, if I add more reactants, then, well, sorry, but it's not going to dissociate. You know why? Because if I have a saturated solution, by saturated solution, I mean I'm equaling my Kc right now, it's at equilibrium, then I can't add more ions. Because if I add more ions, this side of the equation would exceed my K. And I can't do that. Okay? If this exceeds my K, then this becomes a Q. A Q that is greater than K. And if Q is greater than K, what do we do? We try to reduce Q. We try to reduce the concentration of products. If we reduce the concentration of products, we form reactants. Okay, so this number represents the solubility of the solid. If I have a KSP that is 3 times 10 to the 6th in this case, that means I can dissolve a large amount of this in solution. That means I can have a large concentration of Na plus ions and Cl minus ions in the solution, okay? And let's say I happen to add more Cl minus ions. This goes up. Now my Q goes up, okay? My Q now equals three times, or six times 10 to the sixth. And that's greater than my K, okay? So since Q is greater than K, we're going to shift to form reactants. 
to reduce the value of Q until it reaches K. By shifting to form reactants, Na plus and Cl minus reunite into NaCl solid, and that's how precipitation happens. That's how a precipitate forms. When ions in solution go backwards, okay, this is a reaction. And forward is dissociation, backward is called precipitation, right? So if I have a solution that has more ions than the equilibrium constant can handle, if I have more ions than the solubility constant can handle, that means that the reaction is going to shift to a precipitation. And NaCl solid precipitates out of the solution as a solid, as a powder. And now let's get into the common ion effect. We saw here that NaCl dissociates into Na plus and Cl minus. Now I also have something like NaOH. NaOH dissociates into Na plus and OH minus. I don't, these are, yeah, Na plus and OH minus. Okay, so if I were to make a solution of Na plus and OH minus, that solution would have its own equilibrium. It would have its own concentration of Na plus and OH minus that dissociate, all right? So let's just say that once this dissociation reaches equilibrium, I have a three molar concentration of Na plus, okay? I've got a pretty high concentration of Na plus in my solution. So if I take the same solution, the solution that has this Na plus and OH minus ions in it, and I try to add NaCl, I try to add NaCl, NaCl is going to have a much harder time dissociating. You know why? Because Na plus is at a very high concentration in the solution. If I create this equilibrium by dropping Na plus in solution, the concentration of this guy is already very high. And if the concentrations of this guy is very high, then, like Le Chatelier says, we're going to shift towards the left to decrease the concentration of this guy. Okay? That means that if I put NaCl in a solution that already has a lot of Na+, it's not going to dissociate. NaCl isn't going to form Na+, and it's not going to form Cl-. So, and you can see that with a rice chart. If we were to draw a rice chart for this reaction, uh, we take this, we put NaCl solid in equilibrium with Na plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. Okay, initial, NaCl solid, it's a solid. Don't include it in our rice chart. Con initial concentration of this, three molar. Initial concentration of this, zero. Change. Well, change, we're going to form some amount of products. Okay, so at equilibrium, we've got 3m plus x. That's going to be concentration of Na plus, and we've got x, okay? And let's say uh, my Ksp is 3 times 10 to the 6th, okay? No. Let's say my Ksp, in this case, is uh, 3 times 10, or 30. Okay, let's call it 30. Ksp equals 30. So 30 equals the concentration of products over reactants. Reactants is a solid, we have no denominator. And 30 equals 3m plus x all times x. Okay. Now, I know you're instantly thinking, assume x is small. Can't do that. K is 30. You can only assume x is small when k is less than 10 to the negative 3. 
Okay, so the equation is still pretty simple here, though. It's we distribute the x into this and we can solve for 30. 30 equals 3x plus x squared. And it's like a quadratic equation. And we can subtract 30 from both sides. Say 0 equals uh, x squared plus 3x minus 30. And you'd solve for x in this case. Now, again, when you solve a quadratic equation, you're going to get two answers. Uh, one's going to be negative, one's going to be positive. Look at your rice chart. Would it make sense if at equilibrium I have a negative concentration of Cl minus? No. So it has to be the positive root. It has to be the positive x value that we get. Okay. So that x value will be much smaller now. Do you know why? Because the concentration of x represents the rate at which the concentration of Na plus is increasing. Okay? And since we already have a lot of Na plus, the concentration of x, or excuse me, x, is going to be very small because Na plus does not want to increase that much. And if Na plus doesn't want to increase that much, it's not going to let NaCl dissociate into more Cl minus. Uh, that's pretty much all of unit what is this? I don't remember what unit this is. Anyway, enjoy your life, guys.